Uh, it's my pleasure to moderate the last session. In fact, uh, it's a very well organized uh, agenda today. We have seen just earlier how the opportunities in the digital economy. And then earlier we saw the how the economic situation will be. And then now we conclude with our special dialogue with two of our consultants who are well known, Dr. Dr. Hamza Kasim uh, from IA Group and uh, Mr. Edward Clayton, PwC partner. Uh, every storm will have to pass and they will be calm after storm. So as much as COVID has, has all the four ingredients of VUCA and put us in a totally tough situation for the last one year, but it should come to pass soon with all the technological development, with the vaccine, as well as other controls that have been put in the SOPs, etc. So we shall now, instead of crying over spilt milk, or rather maybe the milk is not the right word to use for COVID, uh, uh, crying over the poison that sort of went through the entire globe, how we can live after the COVID is what uh, we would like to hear from the uh, two consultants. And uh, since they have already been introduced by Zaim, the MC, I do not want to repeat. And I think uh, it may be better that we give the time to the two consultants uh, to have the discussion. And I will start with Dr. Dr. Hamza Kasim. You may post your questions uh, for the audience. Later, we will have a five minute uh, uh, question and answer session. So I will uh, pass the floor to Dr. Dr. Hamza Kasim. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, for giving us the me uh, the opportunity and uh, Clay, um, Mr. Clayton is a good friend. So uh, this is thirty minutes. So uh, what time do you have? Uh, each, uh, each of us given probably five six minutes. Yes, eight minutes. <laughs> okay, all right. Let me just start by you know thanking um, uh, uh, the, you know um, uh, the organizing for uh, organizer for inviting me. This is probably second uh, I had a session with them last year. So I think what I'm trying to cover is looking at you know where we go next and where should we focus. I think what I'm trying to uh, say that you know in in uh, we have to accept that the the you know the change remained the name of the game for the post pandemic world. You know we, this is this is the beginning of the mega cha change that we have been. You know, for the last 10, 15, 20 years, we have been talking about VUCA, but I think this is reality. It is here today. And I think we've, we have experienced for the last 12 months what it's looked what it's look like. And uh, it's a dramatic impact on the whole world and the, in the economy and, and enterprise. We also, uh, you know, see that this is, this is going to be, the, it, it's not a very easy uh, uh, transition to the post VUCA world. Uh, we see vulnerabilities in the last 12 months. We have seen, you know, how uh, you know certain sector of the economy are more affected than others. Uh, now we are trying to predict whether we're going to have a K curve, or a U curve, or V curve for the next, uh, you know, uh, uh, for next year or towards uh, middle of this year after the vaccine. Uh, it's still very uncertain, you know, because uh, we're, it's a very difficult to predict how it, it will evolve. But this is this is something that you know every one of us have to start to uh, think through. And what I'm saying is that this this induced change in strategy, pandemic, uh, we have to accept the induced change in strategy, management, operation is here to stay in response to radically changing world. So it's not going to go away, as uh, uh, Tansri Jamila was saying that maybe this is uh, the beginning of uh, uh, you know it's not the end of a pandemic. The more There'll be more coming into the future, uh, so we can't predict, uh, you know, what the future like look. But, but we have to manage risk. Uh, so risk management become very key to all enterprise and government. A uh, new organization model will emerge, and we see the last few uh, twelve months how people start to work from homes, and you know, 
how you know some op uh, company operation have worked in different model and the speed and agility you know of even government to respond to this um, we see the speed of how vaccine has been uh, developed within 12 uh, within a, less than a year so uh, so the pandemic has shown you know what the future will look like in terms of uh, you know, uh, the, and also digitization, which had accelerated. The last uh, session was on uh, digitization. I won't, I won't cover that because they are well covered by the previous. But like previous crisis, there will be major implication. All crises will leave scars. Um, you know, we don't know how the scar for this crisis will look like. But uh, if, if you look at the 1998 crisis, uh, you know, although we recovered. Uh, 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 from from the crisis, but actually, we still, uh, you know, to a certain extent, uh, not fully recovered uh, uh, in the sense that you know we were doing eight nine percent uh, uh, pre crisis. Now we are muddling through five to uh, five percent uh, or at best six percent for the last twenty years. So the collapse of FDIs and you know, and some country after the crisis ninety eight recover faster and. And, and restructure the economy, the Koreans and, and the Taiwanese and the other East Asian country, they were able to you know, uh, learn from the lesson of the last crisis and then restructure the economy and move ahead to be uh, ahead of others. Uh, but we have not been doing this serious restructuring of our sectors. So we muddled through five, six percent, although you know, we would not move away to a technology driven uh, economy. So, so, so the, every crisis will will have discuss, and we need to figure out, you know, how to, uh, you know, how to overcome this, and so that they will not leave deep scars on the economic structure that we have very difficult to recover and reconstruct. Uh, some will lose, you know, some company will lose, some uh, country will lose in 2021. So, what, what, whatever we do in 2021 is very critical. So, it it demand, uh, you know, a sort of leadership, uh, which I will cover later. And the changes will demand leaders, you know, okay, the leaders that can create capability-driven enterprise. What we are suffering in the, in, in the economy is a capability trap, uh, what I call capability trap. You know, uh, uh, it's the same as the middle income trap. We need to see enterprise and government to narrow that capability and move ahead. So, so building resilience is not easy. So as I say, I will cover quickly some of the key factors. One is leadership. We need, you know, uh, the leaders who envision the post-pandemic world, uh, leaders from enterprise, from the corporate, for the public sector, because this is once in their lifetime. The last pandemic is hundred years ago, so every crisis like this will never come. Uh, probably, hopefully, we pray will never come again. But this crisis requires strong leaders in both public, private, to envision the post-pandemic world, and starting from a clean sheet has to enable us to reinvent the, the future. So reinventing the future become a critical competency and, and a capability. And when a countries that are able to reimagine the future, reinvent would probably thrive in this new uh, post-pandemic world. Others which, are, which fail to do so at enterprise level or in company, uh, in country will be left behind. Second thing is investment. Although you know, in the last in the morning we see FDI, FDI is coming to this country, but the focus should be on national enterprise because there is a limit to what FDI can cover. We look at the you know uh, in the in the nineties we start with MDAC and then we start this technology part, and we have not seen that large transformation that is expected expected from our major investment in those infrastructure. We're still a low, uh, you know, low labor economy, and uh, with a lot of migrant workers. Although the government has, uh, in the 90s, has started to, you know, uh, initiated uh, some major project like the MDAC and the Kolem High Tech Park. So we ask ourselves, you know, um, uh, in spite of all this investment, we're still, you know, struggling. So this time, what are we going to do differently? Uh, you know, although we have the digital blueprint, uh, it's fine. We have, uh, you know, we have numbers of blueprint. But at the end of the day, is uh, the stakeholders have to own it. So national enterprise become very important to to look. Yesterday, I was reading the Edge and saying that you know 400 of public listed company uh, operate. You know, uh, basically, um, you know, uh, in the market is the you know value under their NTAs. I mean, uh, many of these are in the old economy. You know, in construction and in in some of the uh, labor cost sectors. So there's a lot of opportunity for people like Bursa to look at these 400 companies and see how do we can transform them, help them, 
and facilitate their transformation to go to the new, the new emergent uh, sectors. Um, and innovation is another area where we, we need to create a new techno vision. Uh, because at the end of the day, as we, uh, for this whole morning, technology, whether we are doing business transformation or, or, or it's all about technology transformation. So the capacity of the country to invest in technology, not, not just digital, but computer and technology, genomics, uh, uh, which, which are all the emerging technology that, that is coming. Uh, other countries are putting their monies in, 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 in those new technology. And you know, we have R&D infrastructure, but we are not able to move to that level of making sure that you know, all this R&D and technology can create wealth creation. So uh, a strong public-private partnership is very important to make sure, I was just talking about there's 400 companies, uh, maybe Bursa and the government should set together and develop a very cohesive uh, public partner, partner uh, partnership that would enable these companies to make that transition or job creation. Otherwise, you know, as we uh, this morning is about, you know, we have structural unemployment uh, and we, uh, stagnating wages. So we need to do something uh, very bold and drastic. So the other one is institutional reset. You know, we need to make sure that we reset our institution. Many of the institution are legacy institution. You know, they uh, were so many overlapping, so many duplication, create a lot of problem for investors, you know. Uh, there's, uh, so we need speed and agility. So we need to redesign, collapse all institution, and also, you know, uh, and really, um, uh, you know, rationalize this institution, make it then more transparent so that we can uh, make sure that, uh, because people are talking about, they want speed and agility. and. In the look at the, at the last 12 months, we can see government can do it in the sense that they are able to, you know, uh, to really um, uh, manage the whole crisis, although there are early challenges, but in you know, uh, cross collaboration among ministries and the way we are driving the, 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 the uh, vaccine uh, looks at, you know, the collaboration between the military, the police and multi agencies. So in crisis, uh, we see greater collaboration and uh, not working in silos. So that's the future, but we cannot, you know, the, the danger is that we, we try to go back to the old ways. And that is the huge threat the country is facing. If we go back to the old ways of doing things, uh, and we have experimented in the last few uh, 12 months, we see, the, we see losers uh, and, uh, and, and those companies that are ahead of the digitization uh, transformation can benefit. Those are, you know, which are still lagged, struggle to really to provide uh, the services and suffer a lot from the, uh, the institutions, uh, from the uh, economy. So culture and values are very important. This is hard to solve, but we need to get a gross mindset uh, culture within the, within the economy, among entrepreneurs, among, among the government, you know, uh, a culture for, of excellence and meritocracy. You know, we cannot have, you know, complacency and mediocrity uh, sort of culture within, within our institution, within our uh, businesses. So this strong new values that we need to, uh, you know, uh, encourage within our higher education for the young people comes in a more competitive, you know, and uh, more self-reliant and not too dependent on what government is, is doing. So we need to drive new culture and, and, and we cannot compromise, uh, com accept mediocrity for, uh, in exchange for excellence, so we, we need to have this. This is a very tough choices that uh, that uh, you know country will have to do. So, the riding on a global platform is very important. You know, we should not be paranoid whether it is China or U.S. Uh, see, the world uh, there's a greater convergence uh, of technology. So, um, you know, we, we need to democratize technology and allowing people to have access to global talent. You know, a lot of Malaysian overseas are doing very well. They don't have to come back. They can be part of this global platform to energize the economy. In the past, you know, we have to bring them home, you know, through this uh, uh, returning talent program. But today, they can be part of this global platform. And, and we have to create this platform for, you know, Malaysian around the world or, or others to be part of this new uh, transition uh, uh, economy. So what I'm saying is that we need to have dual operating model to operate uh, in government or business. One is to, to drive the business as usual. You know, we cannot disrupt everything because it's required time. 
But at the same time, we have a parallel structure that allow us to, you know, to start from scratch, uh, whether it's these institutions or businesses uh, or in enterprise, they need to in innovate and we need dual operating system running in parallel. And, um, and uh, sometimes, you know, uh, we get this, we, we, we don't get the, uh, the right outcome. Uh, so what I'm saying is that the country has very little choice. And I was a you know, member of the Economic Council before in 2009 and 2010, we have won the middle income trap. But I think uh, although we, 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 we have many uh, intervention or disruption along the way, but this time we have to re really do it well. And if we miss this opportunity, I think we, you know, the, the next generation of people will have uh, tough, uh, you know, to what even leadership, we have to bring the next generation of leaders to run the country and run our cooperation. Uh, because, you know, we carry too much baggage of old culture and own practices. So we allow greater mobility of, uh, of the right talent to, to, you know, to surface and, and drive this country. So what we will see is enterprises like, you know, we have continuous transformation. Uh, it's going to be very fatigue for all enterprise, but there is no, there's only choice. If they want to survive uh, the next, uh, you know, five, 10 years, they have to start transforming their business, new initiative, embrace new technology, new processes, new practices, new talent, and continue to do this for the, uh, until they, they, they reach some best practices. And, and you know, uh, ASEAN and Asia will benefit from this. Uh, you know, this, this is what they call the Asian millennium, you know, so uh, we have to be part of this uh, and not be left behind. So I probably, you know, uh, just because uh, uh, I wouldn't want to leave at this and uh, probably in, uh, we'll discuss that we need leaders very critical to have leaders who are able to, mm -hmm. to lead in the you know, more volatile times, people who are bold, very courageous in part making choices. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hamza, for your very insightful presentation. I, I've got several points taken on, but we will discuss it later after the uh, second speaker, and now it's my pleasure to to invite uh, Ed, Mr. Edward Clayton, partner of Price Waterhouse, to give his presentation. You have eight minutes, uh, Edward. Um, but always a pleasure to uh, be on the same panel with uh, my very good friend, uh, Dr. Hamza. We've known each other since those days of the Economic Council in 2009. Um, which were very interesting and have actually had some quite significant impacts on the Malaysian economy, although not quite as much as we'd hoped at the time. So the organizers asked us to talk about uh, business after COVID, you know, what's new, what's next, and if only we knew. But um, like Dr. Hamza, I put together a few points. And um, a lot of my background is in travel and transportation infrastructure, so I'm going to be focusing on those. But what I'd say, first of all, is that we're in both one of the most uncertain, but also one of the most opportunity-rich times that this generation, those of us alive today, have ever faced. So uncertainty, well, COVID-19 is a key driver of uncertainty now, layered on top of everything else. And perhaps in August or September, we thought we could see a nice down curve. Everything was getting better. And uh, we'd soon be back to normal. And then we discovered not just in Malaysia, but in many countries around the world that COVID had other ideas. Uh, and that the foretaste we had in uh, April last year was just a foretaste that the true second wave really hit. And the second wave was much, much larger than the first wave. Fortunately, we'd had some chance to learn how to deal with COVID and particularly how to treat people who were seriously ill with it. So the effects in terms of deaths were much lower uh, per infected person uh, than the first wave, but still very significant for uh, Malaysia and for many other countries too. But what that means is that we don't know when uh, life will go back to whatever normal is going to be moving forwards. We don't know how quickly we're going to recover. Uh, if you'd asked me in May or June last year, I mean, honestly, I was thinking that I would be traveling around Southeast Asia 
uh, reasonably freely again by about September or perhaps November at the very latest. Well, we're in February now, and there's no sign of any travel coming up anytime soon. Uh, not even, uh, in my case, to Kuala Lumpur, as I live in Pataling Jaya. So COVID. Um, what we've also discovered is that the rules of how the economy works have changed quite significantly, or maybe the rules haven't changed. Maybe we just had the wrong set of rules, the wrong models that we were using. We don't know what the rules are anymore. Again, an example of travel used to be that we would say that um, increased air travel drives economic growth. Well, we've had an almost complete cancellation of air travel in the past year, uh, but economic growth hasn't shrunk in the same way. Certain sectors have been hit hard. Tourism, obviously very hard, very painful for them. Uh, the air transport sector itself has been hit very hard, but the rest of the economy has kind of carried on. So coming up, what are we expecting? Well, a lot of governments have pumped a lot of money into the economies in this past year to keep things afloat. Is that going to lead to inflation? Big mystery, lots of discussion about it. We don't know yet, but we're starting to see some increases in commodity prices. So honestly, if the economy worked according to the old rules, then we should expect to see significant shifts in prices over the next two or three years. But we're not sure because we're under a new set of rules. Travel patterns, how are people gonna move? Are they going to be still roaming around the world as freely as they did? Are governments going to continue to maintain residual controls on people for an extended period, even though COVID may have seemed to have receded into the background? Uh, we all got very frightened when we saw just how big the second wave was. And I don't believe that any government wants to risk a third wave, so better safe than sorry. Trade patterns, how are they going to move? not just because of COVID, but because people are trying to uh, spread risk. They're recognizing that when national borders close, if your factory's on the wrong side of the border, that can be a big problem. Working from home. I've been into my own office once since October, and that was just to get a new ba battery for my laptop. I haven't actually done any work in my office uh, since September. So will that continue? And if it does, then what kind of demand patterns is it going to drive? Well, we saw that tech industries, PC manufacturers, Zooms and others did very, very well last year. What are the patterns going to be like moving forward? Also seeing a big set of new relationships emerging between the superpowers. Russia is becoming stronger than it has been for a while. China is becoming very strong and starting to uh, make its strength felt outside the country. The US has had a very significant change of leadership recently. Uh, how are we going to uh, see that panning forward? The Economist this past week uh, had a rather worrying article talking about how uh, she could become one of the Communist Party immortals if he were to successfully um, take control of Taiwan. So some things which are concerning moving forward. And then at the same time as these new relationships, we're also seeing within the current world order or the old world order, a lot of very fundamental questions. The culture wars, which are questioning the rights of certain countries to dictate to the rest of the world what they can and can't do. And uh, indeed questioning their own right to existence. So, a um, huge amount of change going on. On top of all of this, we're seeing massive technological change, a period of innovation like none that we've maybe seen since the post-World War II era. Uh, digital analytics, engineering, biosciences, we're seeing huge amounts of change. So opportunities, well, new energy technologies. We're starting to talk about a world where environmentally friendly uh, electricity is so plentiful that we actually can't find ways to use it all. A bit like data. You know, data was a scarce resource 20 years ago. You paid a fortune if you wanted to use data on your mobile phone. Now, you don't think twice. Is electricity moving that direction? The cost of solar power has plummeted in the past 10 years, in the past five years even. What are we going to do with all that electricity? How are we going to store it because it isn't produced 24 seven, new digital business models. I mentioned here a 50 year rule. 
Um, the idea that it takes about 50 years from the time something's invented to the time that it becomes ubiquitous. That certainly is the case with things like mobile phones. It's been about 50 years since the first mobile phone was launched. Not the kind of phone we know now, uh, brick-like, in fact, more uh, rucksack-like, but it was a mobile phone. 50 years later, we all have smartphones in our pockets. The Malaysian government expects that every single person has a smartphone. We're being told that my psychiatry is compulsory. There's no expectation that people don't have them anymore. So digital IDs are coming, digital communication becoming ubiquitous, but also transportation, fleets of large drones. The picture there is a drone which carries 100 kilos of cargo uh, between hospitals in the UK. Not the kind of drone that you think about when you're taking photographs of weddings or buildings from above, uh, but you should expect to see a lot of these kinds of drones in the near future. New ways to conduct commerce, E-commerce becoming very normal. At the weekend, there's in a shopping mall. It was slightly more crowded than they have been before because people are now allowed to meet up in groups of more than two to eat, and that seemed to be a big draw. But in the shops, I see lots of posters saying, you can shop online right now, QR code. No need to actually buy stuff in the shop. New ways to develop property. And um, a lot of developers are talking to us at the moment and new ways of uh, looking at agriculture. So I'm just going to share very quickly, as I've heard the bell, uh, one more slide. This is the CO2 emissions, which we've seen in Malaysia and UK since 1970. Uh, I, was, I was catalyzed to look at this again by an economist article talking about the way the UK had actually been very successful at cutting its emissions by shifting from coal to gas electricity generation. So I was curious, I thought, well, what's happened in Malaysia? Well, the Malaysian curve looks very different from the UK one. It's not quite as bad as it looks if you consider that Malaysian population has tripled since 1970. GDP capita per capita has gone up uh, sixfold. So, so effectively an 18 fold increase in GDP out of that, 25 fold increase in CO2 emissions. The good news in Malaysia is that since 2014, emissions have been flat. Uh, we've actually had a 40% increase in GDP since 2014 in Malaysia. So we've actually managed to de-link uh, CO2 from economic growth. What we need to do now is to actually turn the curve and get CO2 emissions to start dropping while we continue to grow. This past year, we've seen a dramatic reduction in people moving around, flying, driving. We've seen that you can de-link the economy from CO2. So a big question to think about for our businesses, for ourselves is which changes will make this delinking permanent and help to ensure a green recovery. Okay, with that, I'll hand back to my chairman and uh, I think we're moving into a discussion now. Thank you, Edward, for your presentation and especially touching on the green economy because in future, I think it is one of the key elements that we would like to be looking at all over the world. Uh, I see that there are no questions so far from the floor. Uh, maybe we still have uh, a few minutes. I can post one or two questions to the panel and you can take, you both can take turns to answer the question. On the digital economy, and <clears throat> it's nice to see it's developing uh, well all over the world. In Malaysia, it's also catching up. How far do you think our Wi-Fi and internet capabilities are able to cope with the digital economy? Are we equipped sufficiently? Dr. Hamza and then uh, Edward, you can answer the question. Will there be a bottleneck there? Uh, I think we realized for the last 12 months, uh, you know, there are, you know, congestion in the networks and, you know, the, uh, we need to build the infrastructure uh, and, and uh, it make sure that we don't have this digital divide in certain segment of the society, in certain areas, you know, they don't have access to quality uh, broadband. So when you're working from home, it costs a lot of uh, challenges. So now the government is talking about 5G and they are, you know, uh, so... It, they need to speed up this investment in infrastructure uh, 
uh, because as uh, I, I don't think people are going to go back and work as, as a, a pre-pandemic. The, the working from home is going to be something that we need to uh, you know, uh, accept. So, uh, so the infrastructure, cybersecurity, all this has to be put in place. Uh, you know, has uh, even digital identity that uh, uh, Clayton uh, was uh, was talking about. Edward was talking is very key uh, to get it uh, done. Uh, so, <coughs> so we, we we have a we have gap that we need to close fast. Mm. Edward, would you like to comment on follow up with Dr. Hamza's yes. comment? Yeah. No, we we've clearly seen. Uh, a significant problem over the past year with the network. Uh, my own personal experience is that the fiber network is actually struggling more than the, um, the mobile phone network, in fact. And, and I'm very often finding I'm having to fall back to the mobile phone network when I'm doing calls like this, um, which uh, I hadn't experienced before. So, you know, clearly many, many people working from home. Uh, also noticing very clearly that our backhaul capacity is not good when it rains, then these kinds of video conferences tend to really struggle. Happily, we're in the dry season at the moment, so we're still talking to each other. Um, moving forward, obviously also there are significant parts of the country where we do not have the coverage, uh, which, which is needed, particularly in the rural areas. Sabah and Sarawak have become quite famous for uh, the creative ways in which the local population is getting themselves connected. Um, so that, that is clearly going to be an issue. Uh, what I expect to happen over the next um, four to five years is, is a, actually an explosion in demand uh, for data, uh, not because of what we are uh, doing, working from home, for example, but because there'll be an increasingly large number of machine to machine connections. So my cars now have SIM cards in them. Um, my uh, fridge, I suspect, soon will have a SIM card in it or a data connection. Uh, many other machines like that will start talking to each other. So there's going to be a huge increase in, in data, which is not even involving uh, an individual person in any way. So the networks are going to have to be built out to cope with that. Uh, we're talking about 5G. That should be launched soon. Uh, that will help. But it's going to be, I would suspect, a struggle moving forward to maintain that connectivity. And the other thing which concerns me is the potential vulnerability of our networks. So we had a major medical virus this past year, which caused us a lot of issues. If we had had uh, an internet virus, so to speak, at the same time, we'd have been in big trouble. Luckily, the internet has held up reasonably well over the past year. If it hadn't have done, then I don't know what we would do. We would be in a very different situation from now. So we do need to ensure that we have uh, robustness, redundancy, not just quantity. And one final question before we close uh, is we have been uh, still focusing on the old economy, brick and mortar type of business. For example, some of our big GLCs are still developing 118 stories. And then there, there is the TRX X exchange. And now working from home has reduced the demand for office space, and that could be a new norm. So how are we going to cope with this uh, building uh, infrastructure that's been taking place so aggressively? What are your thoughts about the future on this point? Uh, to Hamza, and then you can Edward. Uh, yes, uh, well, I think in the pre-pandemic, uh, uh, like most people, we didn't see this coming because Although digitization is talked about, we people don't expect it to accelerate so fast. Uh, and I remember, I, I mean, we are in a bank uh, when we see that, you know, we have built the, all this digital platform. We see consumers prefer to come to the bank. And all of a sudden, we, in a pandemic, as soon as the customers uh, are not coming to the bank anymore. So, uh, so the, our readiness uh, in digitization uh, help us to really manage the business well without any disruption. And so what I'm saying that the, what happened the last two, a few uh, months have shown that uh, even the bank uh, in, the, in the time to come may not need the branches as many as we have today. So it's a game changer, as, as you say, with all those investment has to be, that has been done in all these big buildings. Uh, I'm sure they can be put to other good use, uh, you know, uh, so they have to figure out. Uh, but uh, as I see, you know, um, uh, 
we need to have a scenario of that, uh, you know, if another pandemic comes in, how are we going to cope? So all these buildings have to be safe, uh, you know, to provide, so risk management, uh, so that people still can go to those buildings, you know, so uh, people have to rethink the whole architect of, of construction of building in time to come. But those who have invested, you know, this is, uh, they have to figure out and innovate. And I know one of the, uh, the companies that uh, I'm working on, they have turned this building into an uh, innovation hub. I mean, a vertical Silicon Valley housing all the you know, new startups. So, there's, uh, so they can put good use of hosting uh, a, com a community that can you know, innovate and uh, collaborate. And we still need the, the social network. So the building still require, you know, working from home is not really an, uh, an answer to everything. Mm. Yeah. Edward, you would like to add some comments? Yes. Yeah, no, I, you know, I am concerned when I look at the growth uh, of, you know, office space in Kuala Lumpur and thinking about how much will be needed moving forward. So I suspect under almost any realistic future scenario that we will need less than we are currently getting. So then what do we do? Well, in the 1990s, London had that problem. There was a surfeit of office space and they actually converted a lot of it into apartments um, and created more living space. And one thing that's become very clear is that people have recognized now that they need more square feet of living space if they're going to be uh, operating in, a, in a, even a partial work from home environment. The um, views which I'm starting to see around the world uh, that probably people would want to be uh, working from home maybe two or three days a week, still coming into the office to some extent. So there will clearly still be some demand for office space, particularly for face-to-face -face brainstorming, creativity, certain kinds of training, team building, um, those things, it's difficult to do working from home. Uh, so my expectation is that we will see a shift in the way that the urban landscape works uh, we will see um, a reduction in peak traffic flows, which will be very good, less traffic jams. Uh, we'll see a reduction in the total number of square feet of office needed, but there will still be quite a lot. And I think a very significant increase in uh, so change in the way that people, uh, people's flexibility expresses itself around that. So lots of changes expected. They won't be overnight, but I would think that in 20 years time, we'll see uh, our cities in Malaysia and other parts of the world having quite different shapes, sizes, forms of buildings from the ones that we have now, particularly as the younger generation um, who are now working from home, uh, think of different ways to run the businesses once they became the leaders of the businesses. Thank you. Uh, I took the liberty to exceed the time allotted to us because we are the last segment in the uh, program today. Now I'll pass it back to the MC. Uh, thank you to both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you.